Episode number 92 of the Wholesome Fertility Podcast. Welcome to the Wholesome Fertility Podcast. I'm Michelle, a fertility acupuncturist here to provide you with resources on how to create a wholesome approach to your fertility journey. My guest today is Katie Bryan. Katie is the creator of The Single Greatest Choice, a place for women who are worried that singleness might mean missing out on motherhood. Katie helps women gain clarity on what they truly want, create pathways to get there, and most importantly, learn how to manage their minds along the way. Katie hosts a podcast called The Single Greatest Choice, where women tell their stories about singleness, fertility, motherhood, and choice. She also coaches women who want to hit snooze on their biological clocks or need help embracing plan B when life doesn't turn out as planned. Katie moved from fear to freedom on her own fertility journey, and her goal is to provide information and inspiration for other women to do the same. So welcome to the podcast, Katie. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so um, so we actually met online, um, and I thought your story was so interesting, and you actually had me on your podcast, but I thought your story would be so interesting because I've never had anybody on to talk about what you do and why you do it, um, and I think it's such an important topic to talk about. So can you share your story, your journey, and why, what inspired you really ultimately to take charge of your fertility? Sure. Yeah. So it started around the time I was 30, about to turn 37, about a month before my 37th birthday. I had done an at home ovarian reserve test. And so it was just one of those mailing kits where you prick your finger and put dots of blood on a card and mail it off. And I'd been single for about a decade. I'd been divorced in my late 20s. And I knew that it was time to start sort of questioning and wondering. You know, you hear about that age 35 is about the time when fertility drops off the edge of a cliff. So, um, so I sent off this at home ovarian reserve test, really just expecting to check off a box and see that, yep, all levels are good. Everything is normal. And I had no reason to believe that the, the results would be anything otherwise. And when I received the results, I remember exactly where I was standing when I opened that email and my score was right on the line between diminished and average. So it wasn't terrible, but it also did not give me the peace of mind that I was hoping to get from that test. And I also had my birthday looming about a month later, turning 37. So I decided to go to a fertility specialist and get more information about freezing eggs. And freezing eggs had been something I'd always kind of had in the back of my mind and thought about. I'm at an age where egg freezing became non-experimental the year I turned 30. So I really haven't, I'm a little bit on the older end of having that super accessible to me through my 30s. It was something that was more like in the movies and the media, but not anything I knew real people doing in my life. Mm -hmm. So I went in to find out more information about that. And I really just thought I would freeze some eggs and that would be it. And I was in a relationship at the time. It was a new relationship and it was going pretty well. And I really thought freezing eggs would give me peace of mind and give that relationship time to grow. And I, I really thought I'd be, I wouldn't need them. You know, this guy and I would right off into the sunset and start having babies mm-hmm. <laughs> in the next year or two. And those eggs would just be there as a backup plan. Right. So what ended up happening was I went in and my follicle count was, was pretty good. I had, they could see, you know, a decent number of follicles on my scans. But when I started the stimulation to stimulate the eggs, the growth of the eggs, I wasn't responding to the drugs. So we stopped and started a couple of different times, but ultimately it ended up that seven eggs was the most that we could ever get my body to mature simultaneously. So, you know, $15,000 in, and I just felt like I did not accomplish the goal that I'd set out to accomplish, which was creating some level of security for myself. Meanwhile, I'm on all these hormones and I'm in this new relationship and the relationship started to tank probably around the same time I started the hormones. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That might might not be a coincidence. but um, So so at that point, I had a doctor who just really was not very communicative and not easy to work with and just very negative about most things. 
And he made me feel like, well, yeah, you could do another round of egg retrieval, but you're probably going to have the same result. And it's just going to be a waste of money because even if you went from seven to 14 eggs, it's still not enough. And so I just went into total scarcity mindset. Mm -hmm. I I freaked out. I mean, I, I totally freaked out. So here I was 37, a month out of a breakup. And I decided to start conceiving, trying to conceive on my own. And at the time that just felt really like my only choice. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think too hard about it. It just, it it felt like I ran out of runway. This was it. This was the end of the road. If I wanted to have kids, it was now or never. Mm -hmm. And my doctor wasn't saying it in those words, but that's certainly how I felt because the only other thing I knew to do was egg freezing and that wasn't working for me. Right. So I found a sperm donor through a large sperm bank and started doing IUIs. And um, each month, gosh, it was such a process because I didn't, I felt like it was something I had to do. And I think I would have been excited if it had worked, but I also was really relieved each time it didn't work. So there was just a lot of emotional conflict. It was like um, you weren't really aligned with it, but you were doing right. it because you felt like you had no choice. Right. It was not coming from a place of love and, you know, the, the energy that you would want conception to come from. It was just really a fear-based act that I was going through. So it doesn't surprise me at all that it didn't work out. Um, so I did that. I did four cycles of IUI with this doctor who was just really difficult to work with. And at that point, I switched over to a different clinic. And I actually went, before I switched to the new clinic, I went to just my regular OB and did two more IUIs and that didn't work. So now I'm at six IUIs with donor sperm, which is extremely expensive. And, you know, I, I had spent so much money and gotten nowhere. And even if the best case scenario had happened and I had gotten pregnant, that wasn't even really what I wanted anyway. Right. (laughs) It was just all very hard and confusing. So I ended up switching to another clinic and the new doctor just changed everything for me Yeah. because the very first thing she asked was, what is your goal actually? Like, what do you want? Because you don't sound like you're dying to get pregnant. And I wasn't. And it just was so nice to hear someone say, it's okay if you don't want to get pregnant right now. That's okay. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Yeah. So we, um, we came up with a plan and we did another egg retrieval and as predicted, I got another seven eggs, but at this point she really encouraged me to go ahead and fertilize them with donor sperm because without fertilizing the eggs, there was no way to really know what we were working with. So we didn't know, whereas the first doctor kind of said seven is a bad number Right. In end of story. Yeah. She said, we don't know what seven means. We don't know right. what 14 means. You know, when we double that number, we, we, that could lead us somewhere really great, or it could lead us to a dead end. And there's just no way to know other than creating embryos. So we literally put all of my eggs in one basket. <laughs> we took <laughs> the eggs that I had frozen in, um, January of 2018, no, 2019 and the eggs that I froze in January, 2020, Um, I believe it was actually December, but anyway, they were about a year apart. And so we took both batches of eggs and we fertilized them. And the stats that I read led me to believe that I would be really lucky to get even one normal um, PGS normal embryo. And I ended up getting five. And so I was just over the moon that that had been my result because there was, it was just far beyond what I expected. Right. But I also had a lot of grief because it still put me in this place where at that point I was 38. I know that I want children. I'm still not dying to have kids right this minute. I'm willing to go the donor route, obviously, because I've, you know, I've got, I've done all these steps to get here, but there's still this part of me that's like, should I wait? Is it, is it crazy to wait? And so with that in mind, now that I knew the quality of my eggs, I went back and did another egg retrieval so that I would have eggs that were unfertilized in the event that I meet a partner down the road. Right. And with that retrieval, I got 12 eggs, which is the same number that I had when I put the two, the first two together, which was seven and seven, and then two of them didn't survive the thaw. So now I know that work, like those 12 frozen eggs mean so much more yeah. because I know the quality, right. or the kind of predicted quality. Yeah. So through that whole process, I just kept thinking, 
there is so much I don't know. Like there's, so, I cannot believe how little I understood about my body, my cycle, fertility, IVF, even insurance, you know, all the things. And I thought there's got to be a way to share this information. I, I need to get it out there. So I started blogging and I started thinking about a podcast and I wanted to have women telling their story. And what happened was I would get DMs from women that would quickly turn into, I'm spending an hour and a half going back and forth with a woman, helping her and supporting her. And I realized this, there's a need for this. Like this is a niche that I, I, I looked and I couldn't find anybody else really doing that. And so then I went to, I got some training and coaching and now I'm working towards building a coaching practice where I can support single women through fertility preservation and, or moving into single motherhood, if that's a choice that they are ready to, to make. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that your story is so inspiring and we just like so many things about it. We've spoken about this before. I think there's such a huge lesson learned about checking out different doctors because if you go to one doctor and they don't align with you and their psychology can really impact your psychology and what you assume is going to happen. And it sounds like the second doctor was much more open-minded, much more inviting and nurturing really for you and allowing you to really with curiosity, figure out what's right for you. Um, so that's a huge lesson, I think. And also, I'm sure you probably would have loved to have somebody like you <laughs> helping you. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, just the difference from the first clinic where the message was really you're, you have diminishing ovarian reserve and you don't respond well to fertility treatments. So kind of, you need to take what you can get. You know, yeah. just, you have to just do like, do it now or lose the opportunity forever. Right. And then moving to the second clinic and the, and for her to say to me, what do you want? Like, what's important yeah. to you? And for her to, she was the first person to ever ask me, how many children do you want? And that was such a beautiful question that actually made me cry because oh. I was so fearful that I would never be able to even have one. And it yeah. felt so vulnerable to say, I think I want to, you know? yeah. I don't know if I'm allowed to want that right now because of how I feel about my body and my egg quality right. and all of that. And so then she, she really pointed out to me, IUI does not make sense because even if it's successful, now you're going to spend nine months plus, you know, postpartum. And you're not, and all, you're not you, utilizing the eggs. You're kind of like waiting another, right. Egg. It kind of puts everything on pause. And so she, she really helped me to understand what we need to do is create all of the embryos and get all of the eggs that you'll ever need in your whole life before you try to get pregnant. And when I realized, oh, that means I've got like six months of not trying to conceive. I was just overjoyed <laughs> yeah. to have a reason to not, <laughs> to not be like this month trying to get pregnant, yeah. but also to be creating a path towards that being an option for me when I'm ready. Right. So you finally found something that made sense to you, but also like gave you a sense of relief because then it gave you time to think, it gave you time to pause, it gave you whatever you needed in, you know, when you're ready. And so it's interesting, it's crazy how when you do find your right path, all of that pressure gets released. Yeah, I'm just, I'm so thankful and so excited for my baby that he or she gets to come into the world at a time when I am just at peace and feeling abundant and feeling ready, you know, yeah. instead of this kind of frantic scramble to cling to this hope that felt so fleeting. Um, it's just a very different energy. And I'm a big believer in um, try, you know, doing the best we can to, to be in that good energy space. And so I'm just really thankful to have, to see a path to that. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like you're standing in your power. Like you've made decisions that were not easy at all. And you really stood in your power and you took the power into your hands rather than allowing it to just be whatever, you know, whether the relationship works out or this works out or what, or, you know, the, what the doctor said, you really took the power into your hands and I think that that's one of the reasons I really wanted to have you on. It's such a huge message to so many people out there that do feel like the clock is ticking and the power is out of their hands. And it is something that is available. 
you might as well take advantage if you can. So I think it's great. And we also spoke about, you know, from a spiritual perspective, when you had me on about what I thought about doing something that isn't just a natural pregnancy, is it spiritually aligned? We spoke about that. And I really wanted to bring that up here is if you can do it, it's, it's divinely guided. It's there. It wouldn't be there if it's not meant to be. So I think that is um, just really, I, I commend you for that, for taking that charge and also taking that your story and inspiring so many other people. I Thank think it's you. really cool. Thank you. Yeah. You know, something that's interesting is um, I was speaking to a friend and I said, I don't know if I have really the right to use my story to try to kind of guide and support other women because I feel like I am in a place of privilege in that I'm kind of, I feel like I have had a relatively easy path. Mm -hmm. I have these five healthy embryos. I have these frozen eggs. And I know a lot of women do a lot more things and don't have that result. And so I kind of questioned, is it, is it okay for me to be saying, oh, you know, oh, here's what happened to me. And it could happen for you too, knowing that many women are going to face much more hardship and disappointment. And, um, you know, certainly on a fertility podcast that feels, I feel self-conscious about that. Mm -hmm. And my friend just laughed and she was like, oh my gosh, your, your road has not been easy. Yeah. Like it's not, you've, sp I mean, I've spent more than my annual salary on all of these things. I've given myself, you know, 150 plus shots. I've had two losses. I had a chemical pregnancy and a miscarriage. I ended a relationship that was really important to me. You know, all of these things have happened. And what I realized as she kind of laughed and, and told my story back to me in a different way mm -hmm. was it really is a choice to frame it in a positive light, you know, yeah. to see it as empowering, to see it as exciting, mm -hmm. because I could certainly be telling a, a woe is me story about how, like, why, why am I still single? Why haven't I met my person? Why am I stuck using donor sperm? And um, that story is available to me. And I'm not saying I don't ever go there, you know, <laughs> so, some days that does feel like the true story, but I think it's a conscious choice to choose um, a, a story that feels empowering. Such a good point. And that's why I think your story is so empowering is because you, you chose to take matters into your own hands. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's a real huge decision. It's a life, it's, it's years. It takes years it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of money. It takes so many things. And I think it's amazing. I mean, that is, that is a choice you made. It's not the right choice for everybody, but it's a choice you made for yourself. And it wasn't an easy choice, but I'm sure there's so many people out there that could benefit from your story. And of course, it's not going to be identical. We're just not identical people. <laughs> right. Everybody's different. But one, one thing that is similar or shared is the ability and that choice to make those empowering decisions. You right. Know? For sure. Yeah. And just to know how to honor myself in each part of that story and allowing myself, I mean, so at times I've really needed to be sad about the situation that I'm in mm -hmm. and to kind of support myself through that rather than letting it completely destroy me to just acknowledge, you know, it is really hard. I had um, probably the hardest part of this journey for me was I had a real naivety about um, using donor sperm. I don't know how much you know about the whole industry and it really is an industry in the United States. Uh, I've now had the privilege to interview a couple of women in the UK and in Australia. And this is just an industry that's managed so much better in other places in the world. Um, but for me, I really had this picture that even though I was choosing a stranger to be the biological father of my child, that I kind of romanticized who this person was and not that I would ever even meet him or connect with him, but my, I chose a donor who's open ID, which means my child would have the opportunity to connect at the mm -hmm. age of 18. And the story that I made up for myself about how that w could go for my kid, even if it's just one phone call or one email or, you know, one exchange, um, I just was so happy that I'd picked someone that I felt really good about 
being that person on the mm-hmm. other end of that call. And then I came to realize how completely unregulated the, the industry is. And the fact that my child could be one of a hundred or more mm-hmm. children created with that donor sperm. The bank says there's a 60 family limit, which even if they held it to that is a ridiculous number, mm-hmm. but it's, it's really unregulated. So it's probably, you know, it could be much higher and that's hard. And that stopped me in my tracks because I didn't realize how big that number could potentially be until after I'd already created my precious little embryos. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think honestly, I I think it could have stopped me from moving forward if it had happened earlier, if I'd had that information earlier in the process. I might have looked at going overseas. I might have looked at a known donor and someone in my life that could have provided, you know, to be the donor. Um, but because of when and how it happened, the embryos are already created. And so I've had to really support myself through like, it's okay if you need to feel really sad about this and it's okay. You know, um, it's something that I'm working with a reproductive psychologist on because I do think it's really important that I feel more at peace with it before I start telling my child the story of where they came from. Yeah. You know. It's it you know that is such a good example of how nonlinear this is and how how complex it is. I mean, there's so many different variables that come into play, and there's so many different things that you have to work through that come into play, and and it's not this like straight line of moving forward. There's so many different details, and and I think it's great that you're talking to somebody about it. I mean, you're doing. It sounds like you're doing everything that you can really to get through this the right way. I mean, if there is a right way, there is no right way. I don't want to say right way, but I, I mean the, the healthy way, like of, right. of working through it, acknowledging respon- being responsible about it. But there is no perfect way. That's the whole point is that, and the same thing happens with parenting. It starts with parenting as well. <laughs> you know, there is no linear way to parent. And we talked about this before about how People could decide to, you know, the, the whole question of, should I do this on my own or is that not right? But I mean, then there's people that don't do it on their own and ha- have a horrible marriage or get divorced. I mean, there's so many variables that come into play in life anyway, that there is no right way <laughs> to do Absolutely. anything. Yeah. And that's a huge piece of the coaching that I am doing is I think the most important thing when it comes to parenting and even really to parenting yourself is to be able to work on your mindset and work on your perspective and um, know how to frame things in a way that is positive and empowering and uplifting. And that can be really hard to do because, you know, sometimes it's like, I can't remember exactly the, the phrase, but about how like a fish can't see the water because it's all, it's all they right. see, but they don't yeah. see it at all. Right? My daughter was just talking about that. We're like, do they see air? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So, you know, when you're in it, it's really easy to think that there's only one way to view your story. Mm-hmm. And so a big piece of what I'm doing with women is helping them, helping connect them to the fertility information that they need and just you know, the questions to ask your doctor and, and different things like that. But really I'm more interested in supporting women through the mental coaching and framing and so, kind of just self parenting through a really difficult process. It is. And, yeah. Yeah. Because not everybody has a reproductive psychologist or a good friend or a supportive parent or right any of that. And so you really have to learn how to be your own best support and that can be hard to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, when you're planning anything, I think we try, that's why, you know, we get stressed out with weddings or whatever it is. We, we want everything to be perfect. And we're like, okay, I want this in place in that place. But the truth is, like you said, I mean, it's just, it's not, it's not going to be exactly how, but that's life. I mean, nothing is exactly how you plan it to be. Right. (laughs) So it's that kind of flexibility. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And um, you had asked me about uh, intuition or kind of um, alluded to the fact that I followed my intuition, which is kind of funny to me because I feel like that is definitely a skill that I 
um, am, am still a, a, a beginner in. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but one of the things that I have told myself is, okay, at this point, you have to be done with the math and the numbers. Mm -hmm. Because for so long, it was so important to understand my AMH levels and my FSH numbers and, you know, all of those things. But also I just found myself in the constant math of, okay, I'm 35. So if I meet someone in the next six months and then we date for a year and then we get married and then, we, you know, how old would I be when I have the child? And then when I started trying to conceive on my own, it was the same thing. It was like, well, if I, if this cycle works, then my due date will be this month. And this is what that will mean for maternity leave at work and all the different things. And it just was so, uh, it was coming from a very uh, kind of masculine energy, a very like plan heavy mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> energy. And I'm really committed now to trying to just trust my intuition on when I'm ready to transfer an embryo. And so I really have no idea. I mean, my brain can tell you when it thinks like there, you know, what's a good idea and what's not a good idea and what works with work timing and what doesn't, but I'm really trying not to listen to that. I'm really trying to turn that off and yeah. just wait till it feels right. Um, yeah. And that's really hard for me. <laughs> yeah. What's, but what's interesting to me is um, you went through like all of the different mindsets of starting out with the planning and, and the numbers. And then, and then it sounds like when, as soon as you walked into the second doctor's office, it's, it really began at the question is what would you like, you know? And then that kind of just asking, like pausing for a second and asking yourself that that's when you started to get more guided or at least on alignment with your path. Yes. I mean, that certainly was the beginning of it. I think the, the real point of freedom happened when I woke up from my third egg retrieval and she told me that I had 12 eggs. Mm -hmm. And that to me, I wish everybody in the world can feel, could feel that feeling of just total freedom that I had in that moment because it meant I was done. Like I had hard, cold, tangible proof that I could be done forcing something to happen. Right. And it's so interesting because once I had those eggs, I felt sort of a decline in my desire to even have children, mm -hmm. which is weird. Like I've, I've always been a hundred percent sure that I want to have children someday. And the, the problem for me is that the someday all of a sudden became now because of my age. And if I had the choice between have a baby now or be 10 years younger, I'd absolutely choose 10 years younger, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but, you know, just getting to that point of seeing the options that would allow me some time to breathe, I just knew I wanted the time more than I wanted the baby. And that's not a perspective I could have had doing all those IUIs when it just felt like every month the clock was ticking and the situation was getting worse and worse. Are you okay with sharing what you told me about what you decided to think, how you decided to surrender before the 12 eggs? Sure. Yeah. So one of the things that I tried kind of experimented with in my third egg retrieval is that um, I remembered from previous egg retrievals that when I was there on the table and they were measuring the follicles that I was waiting to hear, cause my doctor wouldn't say you have seven eggs, but I would hear her call out those for the first one and then the second one and the third one. And there was a nurse typing it into the computer. And so I remember counting kind of on my fingers as they're going, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how many eggs there were. And the anxiety of that number not being as high as what I thought it should be or what I wanted it to be. And then what I was making that mean. And you know, if you've been through IVF, you go in for multiple scans and nothing really, none of those numbers really matter until the very, very end. I mean, there are women who get tons of eggs and none of them are viable and yeah. 
vice versa. So the third retrieval that I did, I decided that I didn't want to know anything about the numbers at all. And so I was very clear with my doctor. She thought it was a little weird, but she's like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> and so I would bring my headphones and turn on a meditation and just really make sure that I wasn't paying attention to the numbers. So for my third retrieval, I had no clue how many eggs I was getting, but the whole time that I was in every scan and everything, I just kept kind of praying for, or just sort of feeling into double digits. Mm -hmm. So I just, I had had seven eggs, the first retrieval, seven, the second. And so 10 to me felt like a number that was like enough higher than where I'd been before to be exciting, but not asking for too much from the universe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so waking up and having her tell me that there were 12 eggs. I mean, I just, burst into tears. I'm like yeah. about to cry just thinking about it yeah. now. Um, but I do really think that there's such a mind body connection and not necessarily, I mean, I won't rule out the fact that I could have created those additional follicles maturing with my mind. I think that is possible, but I think how I think about it more so is that when you feel anxiety and when you are stressed and, and, anxious and feeling that scarcity and that lack, it sends the flush of hormones through your body that, you know, it's fight or flight. And so your body is gearing up to, to run, not to be fertile and produce quality eggs and those types of things. So I really believed that my anxiety was part of what was causing that lower retrieval number. And I thought that if I could find a way to avoid the anxiety, I might get a higher number. And then I really questioned like, well, what is, what in this process can I control that is adding to my anxiety? And I realized it's, it's the, the count, the egg count. <laughs> I just don't want to know. So you're telling me you're not intuitive. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I mean, you, you're somewhere along the line, you may not call it whatever, you know, you think it is, but somewhere along the line, your thoughts were like almost leading you or guiding you or your there was a voice that that told you or had you consider something different and it was little by little it would guide you and that's really what the intuition is maybe i think we think our intuition is this big different i don't know <laughs> being or <laughs> magical fairy but but we have that and it's about really honing into that voice that is right. our guide and right. realizing that that's been guiding us all along. Right. And I think my experience thus far has been a lot of times where I do hear that voice or I do have that thought and I ignore it and I push it away and I try to use my logical brain to make the decisions instead. Mm -hmm. And there's that resistance and resistance. And then finally I give into it kind of as a last resort. And I'm like, Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. We, that's oh. what you were trying to, I mean, I think I probably could have said from the very first visit to that first clinic that that was not a good fit for me, mm -hmm. but I spent a year there yeah. <laughs> and because thousands and know, thousands of dollars. You don't know any different. And, and, but all of us have gone through that. Like you know, even the most intuitive people found their intuition through not finding their intuition or like ignoring their intuition. Right. And that's how you, that's how you distinguish between the fear-based voice that feels like you have no choice. You got to do this. And the intuition that is more expansive and more aligned really with your soul. I know it sounds esoteric, but it is. I mean, I, I feel, you know, that it's a very real thing. Definitely. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've been learning a lot about that along this process, just yeah. trying to be more open and receptive. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's cool to know that, um, you, you can learn so much about yourself and, and so much about the power of the mind. And the thing is, I think part of it is not, not being on that alignment. You know, that's what helps you to align I think it's got a purpose. Everything has a purpose. That's the thing. Right. Yeah. So well, even you can the feel the difference. has a purpose, you know? Right. <laughs> so is there one message that you'd like to share with the listeners, somebody who's thinking about it or, um, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people listening are not 
I don't know if they're necessarily, you know, in the same exact situation. I think that there's so many, so many things that you can say and so many things from your story that can inspire them to take charge. Is there something that you'd like to share? Sure. Yeah, I can think of a few things. Um, the first is that I think we can get really attached to statistics in this process and we want to make those numbers mean all kinds of things about our body or our chances. Uh, oftentimes we even have medical professionals quoting statistics at us. And I think it's just so important to just trust your own body and your own intuition and your own data rather than rely on what celebrity had a baby in her late forties or the fact that your mom had trouble conceiving in her early thirties or whatever it is, whatever story you're telling yourself that's about someone else and not you just yeah. try to let that go because they think that that holds a lot of people back. Um, on both ends of the spectrum. They either trust too much and they're not worried enough or they you know, get totally freaked out because they're over a certain age or their AMH is at a certain level. Um, and it's just nobody else's numbers but yours right. are, rele are relevant to you. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so that's the first thing. The second thing I don't think I have to say too much about because we've already talked about it so much, but if you are not comfortable in your clinic, if you do not feel like your doctor is your number one teammate, you gotta leave. And it's totally yeah. worth it. And I was there for a year, like way too long. And the story that I was telling myself was, well, it's going to be awkward. It's going to be uncomfortable. My eggs are here. And so it's going to cost a lot of money to transfer my eggs. And what if something happens to them? Or I'm going to have to come back here someday to use those eggs. And that's going to be awkward. And just had all these excuses. And then I changed clinics and it changed everything. And I just think you're going through enough. You absolutely deserve to have those people who you are paying a lot of money, by the way, <laughs> yeah, being on your totally. team, right. Yeah. And really, truly feeling like they're the right fit for you. And they might be, they don't have to be a terrible person to just not right. be the right fit. That's right. That's right. So I think that's the second thing. Um, and then the third thing is I would say, whatever the thing is that you are most afraid of, I would suggest that you find a way and maybe just a little bit at a time to look that thing straight in the eye. Mm. So for me, for years, it was, oh my God, what if I run out the clock and I don't meet someone and I'm single and you know, I'm almost 40 and I don't have babies. And like, I'm living the thing that was the most terrible thing <laughs> that mm -hmm. could have happened to me. And it's fine. I'm yeah. fine. I'm happy. You know, yeah. um, it's been actually really beautiful. And so, you know, if that for you is using an egg donor or maybe deciding that you've had enough of this fertility journey and you want to start exploring adoption or life without children, or, you know, all, all the different ways that you can address the fear that you have, I would just say, get brave enough to just kind of take a peek at the thing that you think is worst case scenario, because most of the time it's not. And I think that one of the things you can do is find stories of people who are living that life and mm -hmm. loving it, you know? So right. whether you can find a Facebook group or you can read a beautiful memoir or, you know, just find a way to, to look at those stories of people who are, in that place that you're afraid you're headed um, and just see what it's like over there because it's probably not as bad as you think. <laughs> right. And also looking at it doesn't mean that that's your decision. Right. It's just, it just maybe giving it a chance to not resist it for like a day. <laughs> right. You know, I've interviewed now, I don't know, about eight or nine women who are either already single mothers by choice, which is what women who go this route are called, that's kind of the official term. Um, it's one that feels pretty uncomfortable to me. Some women love it. I feel like I'm more a single mother by necessity, not choice, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, I've interviewed these women for my podcast and something that comes up over and over again is I had this idea. I thought I was crazy. I thought I might be the only one. And then I got on Facebook and I found this group of 8,000 women mm -hmm. <laughs> who are making yeah. this choice, right? Or I got on, on Instagram and I put in hashtag single mother by choice and the whole world exploded. Opened you know, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, I think there's just such power in stories. And so seeking out stories 
can really be healing. I love that. That is so true. And it, 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 you know, if it calls to you, it's valid. It's, it's your path and there is no one path and that's the beauty of life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, and maybe it choose. doesn't, right. Maybe it doesn't feel right for you just because you've never seen it up close. Right. And it's, it feels uncomfortable. It feels, you know, when I really question what, why I was so resistant to becoming a single mother, almost all of it had to do with what other people would think mm -hmm. and, and not about what the experience would actually be like for me. Because personally, I think there are so many benefits to doing things this way and to still longing for and hoping for a relationship, but just looking at it as two different parts of my life that, that may not coincide, mm -hmm. you know, that may, that person may come in later. And really it was getting over the fear of what will they think if I do mm -hmm. this? Yeah. And that's still a process. I mean, I'm still not completely out in terms of like my personal Facebook page. I don't have this plastered anywhere, you know, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, um, I'm still working on really being comfortable with my story in certain arenas and other places. I'm an open book, but, um, it is, it's hard. Right. It's a process, but ultimately they're not going to be living your life. You know, that's the ultimate <laughs> reminder <Right. laughs> is that they don't, they don't have to live with what your choices are. And, right. you know, it's just, um, it's such a personal decision. It's something that you really need to make for yourself. I could tell you this much. If it was my daughter, I would say, go for it without hesitation. That's, that's what I would do. I mean, I say if it's my daughter, cause I can't say if it's myself, cause obviously I had a different Right. Back from, but if it was myself, 100%, I would do it. But I'm telling you, like I, even for my own daughter, I would say, go for it. Yeah. Plus you'd get a grandbaby out of it. So yeah, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> who doesn't want that? <laughs> you don't have to worry right. about diapers. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. No, my parents are totally on board. I mean, they yeah. wish I would have done this a long time ago. So oh, um, that's beautiful. That's, it's nice to have the support for sure. Oh, 100% for sure. Um, I, I thank you so much for coming on. You are such a, to me, you're such an inspiration. You really are like somebody who really has so much courage, I want to say has balls or ovaries. <laughs> I love it. No, you really, you took charge. That's not like you did something that a lot of people would be afraid to do. I, I think you know that, you know that like in, in your heart, but I know that when you're doing it yourself, you really don't think that because you think about all the struggles that you went through and you focus on that, you don't realize just how much courage it takes to go through this journey. Right. And from this vantage point, I do feel like I can look back and think, wow, I've really come a long way. But yeah. along the way, it's just one little decision after another. Yeah. You know, and I think probably a lot of your listeners are there where it's just all you can do to decide, am I going to do another round of IVF? Am I going mm -hmm. to do another IUI? Am I going, do I need a break? You know, just those little yeah. decisions that you make um, each step of the way. And it never feels like you're doing something heroic um, yeah. at that point. But then when you look back at everything that you've been through and you've survived, it, it really is inspiring. It really is. And, um, and I wanted to ask you just to share, how can people find you? If somebody's going through a similar story or they feel that your, your journey can really benefit them, how can they find you if they want to get coached by you? Sure. Um, my website is The Single Greatest Choice. So it's www.singlegreatestchoice.com. And then I'm also on Instagram at single underscore greatest underscore choice. And also your podcast. Yes. And I have a podcast. <laughs> it's also called The Single Greatest Choice and it is on iTunes. Thank you for reminding me about that. <laughs> iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, all, all the podcasty places. Cool. I will be put, posting all of these notes um, on the episode notes and everybody can find it there. So thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed getting to know you over the past few weeks. Yeah. So, thank you, Michelle. It's been great. Yeah. It's awesome. So thank you again. Of course.